Hey everyone. Last night, I was able to sit down with the old family friend of mine who happened to be a chieftain tank commander back in 1985, I believe is the date. What I did was I collated all of the questions that you guys had submitted from my previous video, asking you to submit questions, and for about 45 minutes I sat down with him and I just went through as many of these questions as I could. If you asked a question that I didn't ask him or we didn't get round to it, I do apologise. I am hoping to talk to him again to go over other topics and other aspects of the tank. So without further ado, let's just jump straight in to the conversation I had with him last night. What I wanted to do, first of all, is um, I know you obviously from uh, growing up and all that, but like I mentioned to you on the phone before, I, I vaguely remember you telling stories of your uh, army days, but I was so yeah. young, so young at the time. I, yeah, I, the details just went over my head, and I just thought, oh, cool, this guy was army. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. Yeah. a lot of people, a lot of people were. <laughs> um, so just, just for my own benefit, could you um, sort of explain how you came to be? A chieftain tank commander. Um, well, basically, um, I came from a really bad area in Glasgow, and the only um, options available to me were prison or the army. So um, okay. I went to actually like, raining one day, and I went into the army careers office to get the rain. And the next next thing I knew, I joined the army, um, <laughs> and the recruiting sergeant at that time in Glasgow was. Um, a guy called Jimmy Laverty, who's since passed away. Um, he was fourth Royal Tank Regiment, so obviously his his what he wanted was uh, obviously for me to join the fourth Royal Tank Regiment. Albeit that I wanted to join the Argyles because all my family have been uh, Argyle and Southern Highlanders uh, for quite a few a few centuries. Yeah. And um, but uh, I ended up uh, the question posed to me was. Um, so do you want to walk everywhere or do you want to drive everywhere? And there's a young 16-year-old <laughs> guy. I thought, well, yeah, I don't want to walk. So um, <laughs> that's why that was, that was the contributing factor of me joining the Royal Tank Regiment. Um, at that stage, it was four Royal Tank Regiments. There's only one, there's only the Royal Tank Regiment now. And um, yeah, so um, I did my initial training in Bobbington uh, as a junior leader. and. The, when you go, if you go to Bovington, you two trades you get in, in uh, the main battle tank are um, gunner and, and operator. So um, that was the two trades I was initially trained up in, as a chieftain gunner and a chieftain operator. So the operator loads a gun, and obviously the gunner fires a gun. Um, and then I went to my regiment uh, at Moonster then, and um, I went to C Squadron. Nine troop, uh, and I was the troop corporal's gunner at that stage. Okay. Uh, just a new gunner, and um, and then from there, I just uh, spent a, a long time being a gunner. Um, then we moved to Tidworth, um, and then as as I've got older, I've then moved from the gunnery seat into the operator seat, um, where we loaded the gun and. The operator does the radios as well. He also does the, um, the coaxial mounted GPMG. Um, he makes sure that's um, that's all. At this point, our conversation was cut short due to a technical issue. So what I'm going to do now is clip the next call in to try and make it follow on from the first call. So I moved to the operator seat um, in Tidworth, um, and then front and on there you. To become a chieftain crewman, you need to be a driver, gunner, and operator, and it's um, it's like you get more money for it. Um, you go from B three, uh, B three to B one sort of thing. Okay. Uh, uh, well, B two, so then you do uh, then you do a mech course, uh, either a, a control signaler or, or um, a driver mech. And I did driver mech on um, CVRTs, um, Scorpion Simmers. Um, so that's, that's how I got to my my B one. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So then, basically, I just um, just went from Tidworth to Osnabrück, 
Um, I was in 12 Troop in Osnabrück and did a few exercises. Um, and the I was I'd, I'd been promoted, so um, we were on exercise. And uh, the troop corporal was then. Um, he for some reason I think he was he, he got ill or was injured. So I uh, then got command of um, four two, um, which is troop corporal's tank in twelve troop. Oh wow! Okay. So, so what uh, what time period okay. was that roughly? Um, roughly. 1985 ish, 85, 86. Yeah, around okay. about then, the, the regiment went to Northern Ireland in 86, so around about then. Okay, and so that was that's right at the end of the chieftain's service life. Yeah, basically, it's um, they were well, we, they just brought in one, they called it Chieftain Stillbrook, which was a uh, upgraded armor. Um, yeah. Uh, but it was just basically a chieftain with upgraded armor, and the challenger had been in about Chal challenger one had been about for a while. Well, a few regiments had it by then. Um, I know two RTR had it and three RTR had it, so uh, we didn't. Uh, we then got rid of our tanks um, in Osnabrück when we left Osnabrück, and then uh, when the regiment moved back to the UK, the split between Warminster and where there was um challenger challenger two then i think um and obviously the mbc regiment at raf honington right okay all right all right well thanks for uh sort of setting the scene <laughs> so, it's, 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 it's fast yeah, you when you're sat in the when you're sat in the opposite the operator seat knowing that um, you can get command of your tank and you think eh, it doesn't look too bad it looks quite easy um, it wasn't uh, when I went sort of my first exercise as command um, in the tank. It didn't help when my driver was called Jimmy and my gunner was called Jimmy, and I wanted the gun to oh. go right and say go right, uh, go right Jimmy, and then my driver would go right and I go not you Jimmy, and I uh, just it was a Scottish regiment, so, <laughs> so a lot of people called Jimmy then. <laughs> well, that actually um, <laughs> that does that that actually that point leads on to. Um, one of the questions I've got here. Um, JPV has asked, I would like to know how long a crew stays together and I would imagine it takes a lot of training to be a cohesive unit. Okay. Um, yeah, the, basically, the once you're in a troop, you're in a troop for as long as you're there, basically. I mean, I was in, I was in nine troop in Munster um, for a long time. Um, then, I went, uh, then when I went back to the UK, I was nine troop. Um, and then when I went to uh, back to Osnabrück, it was 12 troop. You stay in there as long as as long as you want, basically. Um, you've got, I mean, you've got a trooper, you've got a trooper in the driver's seat, a trooper in the gunner's seat, and usually either a trooper or a lance corporal, a more senior one in the operator's seat, and then you've got either a corporal, a sergeant, or a lieutenant in the commander's seat. So you stay you stay in the troop all basically as long as you, you need to. Mm. Uh, yeah. So you get you get tests when you go on exercises. On exercises, there's tests that you do, where you work it. You work as a crew, and you, you get tested on um, parts of the vehicle, um, the limitations of the vehicle, the gun, you know, all that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. But the the the, the crew that you had was it a work, eat, sleep, everything together, or is it a yeah, bit more ex- broken up? Yeah. No, no. When you're in, it's only when you're on exercise. Uh, when you're on exercise or on tour, um, you, you, just 24 hours a day together. You eat, sleep, and um, fire the gun, service the vehicle, fix the vehicle. Um, you're, you're there all the time. Um, when you're in, when you're back at camp, um, you're a, you're part of a troop then. But you're with, it's still your 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 troop is 12 troop. Uh, each vehicle has its own unique crew. So you have four people in a vehicle. Um, and so mine was um, 404142, which was 40 was a troop leader, 41 was a troop sergeant, 42 was a troop corporal. Um, and within that is your own crew, and you stay together as your own crew. But when you're back at camp, you're, you're one troop. Okay, okay. A lot of people have actually put in questions about not so much the vehicles, but the, the everyday, uh, you know, living 
when 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 you're in the vi well, you, when you're up, out on maneuvers or whatever, um, mm. and the, this is a th this is something I've thought. If you're out on maneuvers and you, the hatches are closed, yeah, and you need to go to the bathroom, yeah, what happens? You pee in a bucket, or you poo in a bucket, and it's one of these things. You know, if you're closed down, um, that's what it is. You get there's a in part of a tank, well, part of a chieftain as was then. There's a bucket uh, for washing in. It's um, a canvas bucket, and you could use that, or you just pee in a, a coke bottle or something. Yeah, uh, you just you don't get out. You do you do not go. Most of your that's going to the NBC. It's an NBC sort of like scenario. Yeah. So you're stuck in there. Yeah, you're stuck in there for quite a while. When you say quite a while, how long? It, it could be. I mean, it depends on how long the exercise lasts. Um, you know, it could be so sort of like three, four, five, twelve, twelve hours. All depends. Oh, we're talking hours. We're not talking days. We're not talking days. You, you, you never, unless you're in a theatre combat. Theatre combat. Then you sort of like you, you look at, um, especially like in the first Gulf War, um, you could be close. You could be um, all the hatches battened down. Um, you could be in a shell scrape forward and obviously there was lots of things called um there's obviously lots of threats of um, chemical warfare so you you the, the lads and the, they were um challengers then they were all battened down and they could be there for quite a, a few days unless they oh, put wow. their wow. and so it's a different scenario it, it depends on the scenario you're, you're facing you know when you, it's easier when you're on exercise because the, the tests are just tests but yeah when you're, um, the golf war is a bit different Okay, that. All right. Well, that again. That leads on to. A, well, I've got two questions following on from that. But um, from what I understand at the moment, or what my understanding of the military as a whole is that the the physical aspect of it is not as hard as the psychological. If 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 I'm correct, then as a, as a commander and in a tank with a whole group of other of other guys, what is what what are the challenges? psychologically you face when you're you know in a stressful situation in you know you're in a you're in a, a metal box really mm -hmm. and what what challenges do you did you face then that um have stuck with you or memories that have stuck with you the, the, the role of a tank crewman is, is a challenge in roles it is because uh, if you're on ranges or if you're, if you're doing live firing, um, you know you, you've got to be you've got to be sort of on point with your job. Uh, the operator needs to know what I mean. Listen to the commander. Uh, he's got to make sure the gunner is fully aware because at some stage the um, the operator has to get behind the gun, and the worst thing you could hear is firing now when you're behind a gun. Um, when you got a naive governor, a naive gunner trying to um, trying to get, get fast kills. Um, it's yeah, it's just it's, it's I don't know it's uh, it's not challenging it's not stressful it's just um, you just you want to do your best at whatever position you're in you know the commander's sat up up top he's looking for other targets he's making sure all the information's fed into the CCMU um, you know he's he, he, he's looking sort of like to make sure that when the gunner kills one target he, he, he can then uh, move him straight on to the next target. Um, and things like that, and the gunners obviously he's looking to make sure he can sort of like um, get fire the rounds, use the sit, you know, whatever, whatever rounds fired. He, he needs to know if it's Finn or if it's um, Sabo or it's Hesh. Yeah. You know, he needs what, what rounds what and how fast to travel. He's got to remember his sight picture. You know, if you're firing a Finn stabilized round, it's going to be very, very fast, and you've got to be alert to see where the the round hit the vehicle. If it's if it's hash, you tend to sort of bracket the target, like I explained before. Yeah. You know, you're going to go above, below, and above, then drop drop, drop down on a target, and you know wherever the the round lies, you've got to then adjust the gun accordingly so you can hit it the next thing. And the driver, the driver's get the easiest job. He just sits there. He just sits uh, when it, you know. Uh, or, but if you know what's called an FMX, a fire movement exercise, then he's he's got to be on his, his he's got to know what he's doing. Mm. So it's, it's yeah, I don't know if it's stressful. I don't know if there's any psychological aspects of it. The only psychological aspects of it is in the, when you're theatre combat, your theatre warfare, sort of, like, and somebody's shooting at you. Um, 
we've had um, small arms fire. If you're on an exercise infantry, you run in exercises with tend to shoot at the big steel box with small arms. You know, it's, then you get stressful because um, all your kits and the bins that are attached to the tank and the infantry that you're meant to be supporting is shooting holes in your bins. You know, <laughs> they do, yeah, they do. I mean, that's oh, right. cool. my sleeping bag's getting shot to bits here. <laughs> you know, I'm on guys. So, nah, it's, 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 I don't think it's, there's no, um, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's just, it was a job. I mean, I was never ever stressed. I was stressed as a commander because when you're, I mean, you've got so much things going through your head, you know, you get, you have to make sure you, you're right and left arc. You've got to make sure there's the safety aspects of all. You keep up with the squadron. You're listening on the radio. You know you've got messages coming through in, in code that the operator's got to decode. Uh, there's all sorts of things. Oh wow! Okay. Right. So you're as the commander, you are you have to be on top of everything all the time. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, someone yeah. will be hurt. Sort of thing. Basically. Uh, I've got to be looking at the um, operator to make sure that the he knows what he's doing. He knows that if I've called, if I've um, asked for a round to be loaded, he's ro- he's loading that round. He's uh, doing his job. So I'm making sure he's doing his job um, because there's a certain procedure you follow when you uh, when you load a chieftain. Uh, you load a gun. The gun's the same. The, the chieftain is in the challenger. One twenty rifled. Um, you've got to make sure the gunner knows what he's doing. Um, and you got to also be aware of if the computers crash, you need to then flip to reversionary rev modes, reversionary modes, which means that the, a lot of the younger gunners weren't taught that as much. Um, that was a what we used to call steam gunnery. When I was a gunner, you had to do it by yourself. There was no computers really in, in the tank. You had to all do it by, you know, your skill. Your skill as a gunner got you the kills. When, when all right, when you say skill. What kind of skills are we talking about? Because I mean, I, from the, the the basic research I've done is the, um, it, the sort of is it is it trigonom- tr- sorry, trigonometry and mathematics involved in ranging a target? No, no. no the um, the laser rangefinder does all that for you. But, uh, when oh, I was right. a gunner, so I'm I'm old technology still. Fine. Yeah, well, they, they're still the same in the time. The laser rangefinder is the exact same as it, is, it was back in my day. So the um, you laser the tank, the the distance will come back um, yeah. to what it is, and then you then put it under the graphical pattern. So as you look in your left eye, the, the the range will flash up in your left eye, and then you just put it across to the right eye uh, on the, wherever it is in the graphical pattern. Um, but what, what a lot of things old uh, gunners like me did is when they teach you, they teach you not to cheat. Um, but when you're actually doing it, you save rounds. So when I said to you about Hesh, if you uh, were 200 meters above, you drop 200, add 100, drop 50. So it's, it's, it could be four, five, six rounds before you hit a tank. Most gunners, what they did is they seem, they remember the sight picture where the round landed and then they just dropped the gun that distance and it was usually second round hits which when you get through training, they don't really want a second round hit. They want you to bracket the target. But a lot of gunners just cheated and, you know, got a, got a second round kill. Why would they not want you to hit the it's, target it's just, with the second shot? It's, it's like um, when you are taught to drive, you do everything by the book as per the book. But when you get your license, you, you don't do it now. You don't have your hands at 10 to 2. You don't, you know... Mirror signal and maneuver. It's, 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 you know, they teach you these these things to stick in, but a lot of the times you didn't, you didn't do it. See that? Okay. I mean, learning to drive, you would, they would teach you the safety aspects of driving. I can understand that, but you're, you're learning to operate a machine designed to take out. Kill. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, exactly. Uh, any armor, yeah, but it's just, it's just. I'd rather. I, I'll be honest with you. In battle, I've got because in a tank you only have a limited amount of rounds before your your evidence expended. So yeah. why would I bracket a target six times to get hit at once? When yeah, I can kill. It, I can kill it in the second round. So if I being a commander in a a war type situation, I would want my gunner to hit the target with the first round, if not, 
at least the second round. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's uh, that's not what I expected from mm. from from training. You know, I I expect them to be, you know, we're aiming that's for. Only, that's only with Hesh. Um, Hesh Hesh is a it's, it's a slow round, a high explosive high explosive squash head. So yeah. it's, um, it's 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 a slow round. You've got Sabo, which is your uh, it's armor piercing, then you've got your fin, which is armor piercing. Nine times out of ten, those are first round hits anyway. So it's really only with uh, with Hesh you do that. Oh but, right, okay, okay, all right, okay. Fin piercing, uh, I'd say ninety nine point nine percent of the time. Hmm. All right. Well, that, if if it's based on ammunition type, then I suppose it's uh, specific to each circumstance. <laughs> You don't do every. You don't do that for every type of ammunition, uh, because you don't, there's only one you'd need to you'd need to do that with. Okay, you've kind of answered this one already, but um, DJ Guy's Place has asked: Have you ever been in a tank that was hit, and if so, what was the experience like? Small arms fire mm, is technically fire. fire. I understand that's technically fire, but anything bigger than that? No, no, I never, never. I've never, um, I've never been hit with anything bigger than it was. Then seven six two. Then it went to five point five six. So I've only my my tank's only been shot with um, small arms fire. And just out of curiosity, when you're inside the vehicle, can mm. you hear it? Is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is yeah, that it's a unnerving? A standing? No, this is a bit of a standing joke, really. You just say, you just got a bloody infantry shooting at us again. <laughs> <laughs> you sat in there, you just ting ting. That's my sleeping. There goes my sleeping bag. Ah, <laughs> oh, dear. Right. So you're. It's it's relatively safe inside the vehicle. Then, if it's just small arms fire. Oh goodness, yeah. It's not. I mean, there's nothing real. There's nothing to. No, it's no small arms fire. I can get through it. Um, the only trouble is that can, um, you've got a lot of lenses around your, uh, your commander's cupola and yes. you have in the gunner's lens and all that, so you just don't want them getting shot. Oh, yeah, that's fair enough. I can understand that. You've got a telescopic, you've got a telescopic sight as well. There's like a, it's a tiny little thing. You've got a bloody good shot to shoot that, which yeah. is like a last resort one. Okay. I think I'm going to move on now to some questions about the vehicle itself. Um, okay. One of the most, well, one of the most common questions is that the engine was, the L60 engine was notorious for, well, just being terrible. It was it? Good. Is that true? Yeah. Um, you get the L, L's, it's different packs. You get 13 alpha pack, 7 alpha pack, 11 alpha pack. It's all British Leyland engines, so yeah. um, obviously it was definitely going to break down. <laughs> Yeah, the um, the engines themselves. If you got a good engine, you looked after it. It, it was really, really good. But it, it was very rare you got a good engine. Um, most of the time, um, it was engine lifts constantly. When you say good engine, what do you mean by that? The one that didn't break down. Did the, what were there were there batches out of the factory that did break down and didn't break down? Did you know that before going in? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it was it's a common fact that I mean you could actually you could start your tank up and um, leave the engine running perfect, move it an inch and it dump its oil. So the uh, yeah the the technology the engine technology was was poor, but the so, Remi the, the were good because they can have the, um, the decks off the engine out and the new engine in um, really quick. How often did that cause major issues? Was it well, like once a week? I uh, know. I mean, obviously, when you're in camp, it's very rare that you um, have an engine fault. It's only when you're on exercise when it's getting put through its paces. Um, then you tend to sort of like push it, push the engine a bit. Then so that's when your problems, your problems arrive. Um, and then you have to go to the, the dust bowl or an area where you, you drive to this area, and then there'll be lots and lots of different tanks all getting their engine lifted, um, or change the GU engine or the main engine. So that was. A big enough issue for it to be a downside to the vehicle. Yeah, that was my um, that was my welcome to my first command. Um, I got I went to an advanced contact and um, 
and my engine went and I ended up sort of like um, sitting the rest of the exercise out with a, a broken engine. Oh, wow. Right. Okay. So you, you could be just in the in the middle of an exercise, middle of a yeah. field and just engine dies. Yeah. And that's it. You just wait. That... Wow. Okay. You just, you just wait there. Um, you wait there until the remake come and fix you. How long does that normally take? It could be. It depends how many engines are broken down and where you are. It's, it's like the AA, you know, they're, um, you know, they've got a lot of call outs. You're in a line waiting. <laughs> it's, it sounds like it sounds like that was bad enough for it to cause major issues. Why was that never fixed? What was it? Was it they just? Did, yeah, they did. They upgraded the the engines. The engine went from seven, I think it's seven alpha, eleven alpha, thirteen alpha. So the engine got upgraded, and the common faults were. Well, they, they try to eliminate the common faults, and a lot of them. Um, you know, but when they did, I mean, I don't know what about, I don't know in my time, maybe five tanks I've been on, that have engine lifts. You know, so it's although they did break down quite a lot. I mean, I was fortunate that I didn't have a lot of them break down on me. Okay. How? What? What was the regularity of a breakdown? Are we talking weeks, months? No, it's, it could be any time. It could be. It could be anything whatsoever. You know, you could um, you could go at well, my troops' vehicles. We could go for a, a whole year without having to lift a pack. Oh right, okay. So it's it's, it's only but it's, it's only usually when you're on exercise or you get called out or that was the only reason uh, when you had to put them uh, run them for a long period of time. It seemed that they tend to um, they tend to give up the ghost. Right. Okay. So from. From what I've understood prior to this conversation was the engine was terrible. It would, and I, I, I was under the impression it was like, you know, every week you'd have a malfunction and you'd be out of action, but it yeah. it, it wasn't that yeah. bad. No, it depends. Bear in mind, you've got to understand, Type 57 regiments have 57 tanks in them, you know, so they didn't all break down. You know, you might have a yeah. couple. Yeah. Um, you know, a couple might break down on in an exercise. You might be lucky and get two or three in a whole exercise break down on you. And bear in mind, if you've got, say you get three tanks broken down, that's a whole, that's three crews out, that's three guns out. But that's that's still relatively small numbers given the overall capacity of the uh, of the unit. Yeah, it is. They are, they are, they were terrible engines, but, um, you know, they weren't terrible. Sometimes you get a, a good one that's been, I don't know, maybe the Remy have fixed it better or they've put a, a different part on it you know it solves a, pro a problem a pre-existing problem i don't know um so you could be you could go in an exercise have a brilliant exercise and come back without um, any faults whatsoever wow so they it was a very breakdowns were sporadic it was never yeah. just never never predictable no 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 not a chieftain no right okay yeah i mean i've my background working on um hgvs my understanding with the mechanics was with the engines i worked on there was always something it was always one of three things that would bring a bring an hgv into the garage and it was always predictable you could always tell but from what you've said it sounds like it was just you know it could be anything. flip of a coin uh, as i said i didn't do my um class one on chieftain engines i did it on um, cvrt engines which were jaguar 4.2 engines so it was a lot easier because they didn't really tend to break down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I from from what you've said, I I un, I can I can see that it was it wasn't a brilliant engine, but it's not as bad as I was. No. Thinking. No, it's not as bad as yeah, a lot of people think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. As far as vehicles go, the Chieftain itself was designed as an as an answer to the Soviet era tanks of the 60s t72 t80 yeah t54 55s did you ever have to I'm, well, I'm, I'm assuming that there was specific training on this is how you knock out yeah this this vehicle yeah you get used to um when you were in camp you had to go and do through your gunnery skills um in the simulator 
and um, and you get I'm a bit, I'm a recognition. So basically, you had to look at Soviet. Obviously, I was in during the Cold War, so you had to make yourself aware of the Soviet vehicles, um, BRDMs, um, things like that, um, and obviously T54, 55, uh, 72s, and T80s, and the different types of armor. Um, most of them are normal armor, um, then, but they, I think the T80s end up with um, reactive armor. Yeah. So you get that. Which, which one of, of of all the potential threats you could have faced, which one was the most formidable? It would have been a T80 um, because it, uh, the technology was a lot better. 54, 55 were it's embarrassing. They were really, I mean, obviously the, the numbers depict when they were built. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the Soviets got rid of them to a lot of, um, especially in the first Gulf War, a lot of the um, the first tanks that you came across would be the T-54, 55s and Scorpions have got um, a 76 millimetre, a 76 um, millimetre gun. They could take out a, a T-54, 55. Um, so that was quite embarrassing. And T-72s, they were a bit, little bit better. Um, so, but the chieftain would take them out easy, and then TA's chief, the chieftain there, chieftain was a very good tank um, during the Cold War. But the Challengers could sort of like they're a lot better. The firing system, fire control system is a lot better. Yeah, and and it was, it was designed for the Shah of Iran, so uh, the Challenger one was designed for the Shah of Iran, so it was good in the desert. Yes, I am. Um... I was I did some some research on the chieftain and the uh, I think the only time it fired its gun in anger was in 1991, in uh, the Iraqi Kuwait war. Yeah. And, it, and I think I think in that engagement it was up against uh, 55s. And uh, the chieftains first, just outclassed them. Yeah, the the yeah the challenger there as well. So um, yeah, it was. It's the gun. You put anything, wrap anything around that gun. That gun was phenomenal. With the IFCS system, was way in advanced. Um, you know, that was that was what made it, it made it a formidable machine, a formidable gun, and it was rifled. And the um, Russian vehicles didn't have rifle bores. Uh, they had smooth bore, um, so we were more accurate. Um, our fire and movement was superior. So, yeah. As far as engaging targets, was it was it primarily sit, hold down, and fire from stationary, or no. was it on the move? Well, they, no, you do both. Uh, the, the chieftain and the challenger, because of the gun, is um, quite formidable. Um, either sitting still and or moving, um, because of the stabilising the stabilising part of the gun. You, you mean it will stay on the target no matter what terrain you're going over. Yeah, it's a, a very very good gun. Yeah, under range because we used to do what's called higher lip shooting, and higher lip shooting was um, you know it's, you can you look at sort of like 10, 10 and a half kilometers. Ten kilometers. Yeah, you look. You use basically. You could. Yeah, we had the ability to use the the gun as a artillery weapon as well. Really. Mm. Okay. Never did. What? Never done it. But, um, yeah, it was. Um, if you do you, you do higher level shooting, it's, you can go up to so like ten k. So you what you just elevate the gun as yeah max elevation and yeah you turn get it a into fire an artillery mission, piece. Fire, yeah, it's a fire mission called in, and then obviously um, it's very rarely gets done. I, I mean, I've never had it been done, but the, it has a capability. Wow. Okay, I did not know that. And that that would just be firing high explosive. I'd be firing whatever. Yeah, but probably it probably be Hesh should be firing then because there's no point in firing Sabo or um, Finn at that. So no. it'd be Hesh. The Hesh is a artillery round. Wow. All right. That's 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 a whole new um, side of the vehicle I didn't even know about. That's <laughs> that's quite cool. Very versatile. I've got a uh, got a question here from. G Muzz and it's which contemporary NATO tank would you elect to crew in the chief if, if the chieftain wasn't an option? Uh, leopard. So Leopard One. 
Leopard one or two. Well, Leopard one was on par with us as Chieftain. Leopard two as is now. Yeah, I'd have okay. a Leopard two old. Yeah, that's that's a conversation I've had. Well, I I know that all the all the major powers, well, since the end of World War Two, have decided that they've got they're going to prioritise sort of firepower over armour and mobility. Um, from from your point of view, with your experience, if you had to um, sort of design your own vehicle with, based on what you know, would you change anything to do with the uh, the chieftain? Because I know some people th- there's the there's the whole conversation of what tank is the best tank, and you know some will say you know the Abrams or the Merkava or or what what have you, but. The, uh, it's a different era now. Uh, tanks nowadays, the Abrams and the Challenger 2 and the Leopard and all that. Um, they're different. It's a different era from my time. If you look at my time, it was Leopard 1, it was M60, it was the um, Chieftain. So they used to hold um, competitions for tank crews. Yeah. Uh, the Canadian Army. And uh, um, you'd go up against them and fire movement exercises, all time exercises in regards to the gun and, and firing. And the chieftain done re- used to do really well, um, but the is it's, since it's um, since it's sort of like um, demise uh, and the Challenger Two has taken over, it's not done as well. Uh, the Leopard is predominantly outperforming out, out um, in any any competition. Oh right, okay. I know that I know that le- the Leopard is a very successful vehicle. There's a lot of people using it. A lot of yeah. countries use Leopard. Okay. All right. Not only Germany. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's um, that's about it for the uh, for the for the questions I've got here. Um, the last thing uh, I wanted to ask you was I have a I like to ask this question to any uh, service member or ex service member because I I find it interesting hearing their answers, and that is there are very different attitudes towards what. Uh, active service or retired service members uh, different attitudes to the way they view what they have done or what they are doing some are happy to, to receive thanks for what they've done and others just say you know don't thank me it was my job mm. what's your take on that my job you don't want you, you you don't you don't expect anyone to sort of thank you for it or anything it's just it was just a job it was the no, it wasn't just a job um, I took, um, I took, I've got, I've actually got it on my wall. Um, I took a load, uh, oath of allegiance to the Majesty of the Queen. I've got it on my wall there. Uh, the Queen's shilling as, as was then, um, stating that I would proudly defend her, uh, the Queen of Country. And I did it for that. I, um, I don't want to belittle it by saying, oh, it's just a job like a welder, a plumber, and no disrespect to those trades. But yeah. um, when I when I took my oath of, oath of allegiance, it was to Her Majesty and to protect Great Britain, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That was my job. That was my that was my job. Um, you know, and that's why I'm proud. I'm a proud nationalist. I love the I love the royal family. I love the Queen um, because you know I've that's that's what I swore to do. Then and now, if um, I was ever, if I was ever called upon to be in, like, to command another tank or crew another tank or anything, I'd still go because that is you take that oath to the day you die. All right, I think what you've said there, from from my point of view, I I would thank you for that. That's what I would say thank you for is that uh, the oath that was taken and the. Um, the willingness to defend what you believe in mm. so yeah I, I can understand when you say it was a it was a job but yes i can i can also understand that it was a, a whole lot more than that all right well I, i'd like to thank you very much for your time and i'm sure everyone um will appreciate your 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 answers to their questions and also appreciate your your service to queen and country thank you very much well, it's just still serving now. Um, so I've been a prison officer now for um, 29 years, so I'm still serving the crown.